I'd, I'd been under the snow for a few minutes. I don't know exactly how long, but long enough that uh, I was fading. I, did, I was lacking of oxygen. And so I was starting to fade. And uh, that by itself was a pretty serious wake up call for me, I think so. Welcome to episode number two of the TMAC Impact Show. This episode was pretty special for me as I got to interview one of my childhood heroes. Snowmobiling and backcountry snowmobiling specifically have been a huge part of my life. And if you know the snowmobiling community at all, you know that Brett Rasmussen is one of the pioneers of snowmobiling and how far the machines have come to the, these days, the riding techniques that are used and all of that. So it's really cool for me to be able to have a conversation with Brett to learn how he grew up, kind of how he got into snowmobiling and the development of snowmobiles through ultimately the M series, which was in 2005, that ultimately changed snowmobiling and how we can access the backcountry. Really cool hearing that story. And then finally, we wrap it up with avalanche safety, talking about how the only real avalanche professional is a dead one and the story of the time where Brett was actually buried in an avalanche himself. So I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. If you haven't listened to episode one, after this, go back and listen to episode one so you know a little bit more about the vision of this podcast and why I'm starting it and how it's gonna be a cool grassroots movement of helping people's stories get out there with the platform. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did having the conversation. First, I just want to say thank you so much, Brett, for coming on. This is, I've said this a couple times to you, but this is very much full circle for me because growing up in South Dakota and riding snowmobile, literally the school DVDs is what taught me how to ride snowmobile. And that became a large part of my life for a long time. And now I get to come here and have a conversation. So thank you so much for coming on and having a conversation today. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it's my pleasure. I'm glad I can uh, find time to help you out here. Sweet. So a lot of people listening to the podcast might not know who you are, and we're going to get into some of the snowmobiling stuff. But first, I want to ask, like, where are you from and how did you grow up? I'm from a small little community outside of Preston, Idaho, called Mink Creek. And uh, I've been here my entire life. Uh uh, on the family farm. I'm actually fourth generation owner of the farm. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of my passion uh, to take care of the property and, and, and see it through. Yeah, what kind of stuff is it that you guys are, are farming there? You know, uh, primarily crops, uh, alfalfa, small grains, I don't keep any livestock, because that seems like I'm gone all winter. So it's hard, hard to manage that uh, when I'm away, but uh, we've got uh, a great property that's bordered on the back by uh, a River Narrows, and uh, it's it's uh, the truth is it's not much of a farming property. It's more of a, a family uh, recreational property. So when you were growing up and farming in the winter time, what was that? What was like that like back in the day for you and your family? In the wintertime, uh, we had, when I was growing up, we had uh, a dairy. So we had to take care of the cows, uh, milk them twice a day, feed them three times a day. Uh, we had, uh, my dad uh, actually used to feed the dry stock and, and beef cattle with a team of horses and a bobsleigh. And I can remember very vividly from a very young age, uh, riding the bobsleigh and helping him feed the cows. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. And then at some point, a snowmobile became a part of, of your life within that. Was it more mainly for utility or how did you get introduced into that? Well, uh, uh, it never was in fact, for utility, although that may have been the underlying reason for purchasing one, thinking that maybe we could feed cows on a snowmobile, but never did work out. I remember actually taking a car hood, turning it upside down and towing it with the snowmobile with, with hay stacked on it. Uh, never did work out. 
so good. We reverted back to horses. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Were the cattle scared of the, the sound of the engine or? Oh, I don't remember that at all. Um, I think in the winter time, they're more focused on the food than they are being afraid of anything. So they're just like, we got to make sure this guy gets here safe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. And, and so what, what, how old were you when you first got a snowmobile? Uh, my dad brought home a 1968 skedaddler, brand new, uh, snowmobile, uh, skedaddlers, not a very well-known brand name, but it eventually became a AMF Harley Davidson. So there's a, there's a little heritage there, I guess, but, uh, yeah. I was 10 years old at the time. Okay. 10 years old. And, and when you first got that snowmobile, what were, was it a surprise for you guys? Or had you guys been talking about getting a snowmobile for a while or what was it like when you got it? And then when you first went out for the first time and crushed some snowflakes with it? You know, I don't remember all the details. I, what I do know is that the snowmobile came from an uncle of mine from Boise, Idaho, actually, who was, uh, he had a small engine repair business and became a ski daddler snowmobile dealer. And so that's how my dad, uh, was able to get that. Okay. So, so we had a connection. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and then what was that snowmobile like? Did it have any suspension at all? Or how long, how long were the lugs on the track? How long was the track so it was it was a single cylinder at a jlo uh brand engine in it uh can't remember the displacement it was something like 18 horsepower uh bogey wheel suspension so virtually no suspension at all leaf leaf springs on the front it uh tipped over all the time in the field um uh, I remember riding it on a single track, ungroomed uh, snowmobile trail, and it was brutal. It was um, it, it was no fun at all. Okay. And clearly then at some point in your life, it did become fun. Were you like from day one when you got it, trying to see where you could take the machine or was it as the technology progressed that it became more of something that you could enjoy rather than, I mean, honestly, from what you're explaining, I would maybe rather walk outside of the, the novelty <laughs> of riding something like that. But so when did it? So uh, we didn't know any better, right? Um, this, this was a new wintertime phenomenon, uh, supposedly a recreational activity. And there never was a moment that we thought that we could access mountain terrain in it. It was, if you could get it from one end of the field to the other without getting stuck or broke down, um, that was a success story. Uh, they, you had to constantly adjust the carburetors, uh, the, on these, on these sleds, they, uh, the belts, it was only 18 horsepower sled, right? And but yet the belts uh, could be burned up uh, like it was normal. And spark plugs, every time you rode it, you were changing spark plugs. Uh, there was no such thing as oil injection. So it had to be pre-mixed, which was kind of a, could be a messy job. Uh, you know, spilling gas and oil and, and whatnot. But it was, uh, uh, what I'm describing is, might not sound like a lot of fun to, to a lot of snowmobilers, but it was, it was a challenge, right? It was new. It was, yeah. it wasn't something that everybody did. And, uh, uh, you know, we, as kids, we always uh, did uh, sleigh riding uh and because of where we lived we had a uh a, a lane right uh if you will that uh came to the house uh that was on a slope and it would freeze over and ice up and we had dual runner uh sleighs 
and we could get a lot of speed uh, on on the ice with that. So that was our favorite wintertime pastime. Uh, but it was a long walk back to the top of the hill, <laughs> right? And with mm -hmm. the snowmobile, it was it was a new adventure, a new challenge. Uh, it never was fun as I look back on it. <laughs> okay, man, I agree that yeah, that one being a new phenomena. That's probably what the it was keeping you wanting to pursue that. And so it sounds like from day one of snowmobiling that you were probably being like, okay, this is happening. Here's how we can fix it and adjust. And so did you, I mean, from the beginning, just want to see how far you could be pushing the machines with changing this or that? Well, yeah, um, I would go along with that. So uh, we, so this was in 68 by, by yep. the next year we had, uh, actually uh, purchased a, an Arctic Cat Panther with slide rail suspension. And, uh, you know, when I say slide rail suspension, it worked. It offered stability. It still was only three or four inches of suspension travel, so virtually nothing. But yeah. uh, but it, was, it, it wasn't it was a very powerful sled either. Uh, so we could manage with this small suspension travel uh at any rate this this arctic cat really stepped up the game and we could actually go beyond the field um to the hills uh with mm -hmm. this machine and and so to answer your question yeah it had lots of limitations and we would we could we actually had something now that we could work with and yeah. modify and uh, tune and adjust and uh, try to make it better. So, um, and then, you know, as the, as the years progressed, uh, uh, fast forward to the mid to late seventies, uh, we were actually doing a lot of modifications to make these sleds work in the deep snow. And uh, so the most, the most powerful snowmobile that, Arctic Cat built was the El Tigre. It was a free air, 500 cc twin cylinder uh, Suzuki engine at the time, and I don't remember the horsepower, but it it so uh, you know you could go, you could scoot across the field pretty good click. Um, when it came to mountain use, it didn't have enough track. It was the sled was designed as a race sled. And so we were, we found ourselves putting Panther tracks, which were longer and wider on these El Tigres, uh, tapering the running boards up so for more snow clearance. And we really thought we had uh, a, a high performance mountain sled. That's funny. And, and so racing is kind of this, this start and later on in your life. So in the mid seventies there, you're in your mid to late teens, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what, how did you get like introduced in, into racing? When did like hill climbing or snow cross, or were you going to the back country? At what point did it start to become maybe competitive for you in, in either the racing or pushing it into the back country? Well, uh, let me say that, uh, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you know when the first snowmobile race was? It was when they built the first, the second snowmobile. <laughs> Yeah, so that's fair. So, uh, so anyway, uh, snowmobiles have always been highly competitive. You always had to outdo the other guy. You always had to go faster, climb higher, whatever. Uh, yeah. I never got into competition until quite a, quite a bit later in life. We did, we did attend some oval races. They were popular out West in the very beginning. Uh, and then cross country kind of took over. I, I, I did a few cross country races, but I never really uh, felt like that's something that I was. I, I did. I just didn't have a lot of interest in it. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, along came the uh, discipline of hill climb, uh, snowmobile hill climb racing, and I that fit what I, my desire, because 
that's what we did with our sleds was just try to get higher on the mountain. Um, we -hmm. worked really hard at, uh, trying to get to the, or trying to make the high mark. Um, and whoever made the high mark obviously was the winner. And, and so we, we did a lot of work to our sleds to get them to go faster and, and make a higher mark on the hill. Uh, Mm -hmm. Jackson Hole, uh, the World Championship Snowmobile Hill Climb. I don't remember for sure, but it's it's like 55 years old now. Um, wow. So they did that from the very early days of s- snowmobiles. Uh, in the beginning, it wasn't, well, it certainly wasn't a sanctioned event, and it was just some locals that got together after they shut the ski lift down in, in Jackson, and and they wanted to see who could make the highest mark on the hill, and that's where it started. Uh, and it advanced into a, a huge event, uh, which it is today. And I, I took a lot of interest in that. And uh, but uh, but I was thirty years old when I entered my first hill climb race. So. Uh, really? Yeah. Okay. And were you competitive right away or did, did you have to grow into that or? I feel like I was fun? pretty competitive uh, because I, I spent, well, I had a snowmobile dealership and by now, yep. and uh, we, we kind of specialized in deep snow performance packages. And that was uh, what we were recognized for. And so I, I I knew my way around making a snowmobile climb a hill. Uh, I didn't have a lot of experience in performance or, or racing, I should say, but I did in backcountry uh, performance. And so I, I fell into it um, pretty quickly. Uh, they didn't have novice classes or semi-pro classes or entry-level classes. It was it was, there was only one class and that was the pro class. And so, uh, to compete against racers who had been there for a few years was certainly a challenge. Uh, and I, I can say that it took me a few years to, you know, really, uh, fill the role, but, uh, not very long. I, I, I caught up, I had a very successful 15 year racing career. So. Yep. Okay. And when when was it that you got introduced to being a dealership? Obviously, your uncle owned. You said owned a dealer. What did that play any part, or how did that opportunity present itself to you? Yeah. So before that, uh, my because of my uncle and uh, his relationship with dad, you know, he dad actually got uh, acquired an Arctic Cat dealership in the early seventies. Uh, and we ran it from the farm and I was of course, uh, not even a teenager, uh, at that point. And, and I, I started working on snowmobiles and tearing them apart and doing general repairs. And, and it was, it was a part-time business. And, uh, and I, I, I just took a huge interest in it. And, uh, at some point, Arctic Cat wanted their dealers to become more professional, I guess, maybe is the right term, but they didn't want farm operations. They wanted city operations. And yeah. and that's when dad kind of pulled the plug on the dealership and let it go. Mid seventies, something like that. But they, uh, he actually kept the repair end of the business going, which I had a, a big, part of. Uh, most people remember when Arctic Cat filed bankruptcy in 81, uh, I believe it was. And uh, this this was a point in the snowmobile industry where they the, the whole industry was reduced from in excess of 100 snowmobile brands to uh, just a few. And uh, Arctic Cat uh, filed bankruptcy and reorganized and came back in 84, I believe it was, 1984. 
And that's when, uh, by now I was in my early twenties and I actually was able to get the Arctic cat dealership, um, right after they came back into existence or, uh, right after their reorganization. And, uh, so, uh, and uh, believe it or not, they allowed me to do this on the farm. So I was operating <laughs> the dealership back on the farm again uh, for uh, well until 1990. And that's when we decided that we were going to step it up and, and move to town and, and which we did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How do you talk it into being back on the farm again? Is it, how did that work? Well, I, uh, it was, I didn't really have to talk too much. I just, you know, okay. we had, we had an existing uh, uh, dealer number and they just reactivated that dealer number. I think at the time they were uh, just uh, uh, coming back from a bankruptcy reorganization and they were welcoming, welcoming any dealer that they could uh, get to uh, come on board. And so I think the timing was right. Uh, it, uh, the early days there were really a, quite a struggle because um, uh, Polaris was and Skidoo both were and Yamaha. There were some still quite a few names uh, in the industry. And I guess so the big names, uh, Polaris, Yamaha and uh, Skidoo were our competition. And they uh they weren't recovering from bankruptcy you know so they had mm -hmm. they had a pretty good product uh compared to what arctic cat was trying to peddle so so this is something that um forced me to uh, uh dig deep uh in my <laughs> uh knowledge uh and develop a better snowmobile or a package to make these snowmobiles better yeah and, yeah. Okay. And, and so you've been, it sounds like mechanical your, your whole life and working on them from the first time the snowmobile got brought home. And then you were, you were riding in Rimshaw over at Jackson and, and seeing what you could do, but you were mainly focused on backcountry stuff rather than just hill climb. Right. Yeah. You had a lot, and you had a lot of experience though, doing all these different tweaks to snowmobiling. Is that how you got the nickname, the professor or how did, by having these, what I would maybe call it sounds like Frankenstein sleds or <laughs> how did that, how did that nickname come about? That's, that's a fair question. Uh, I, I don't remember where or when that, uh, uh, professor name came, but it was later, uh, much later. Okay. It was after. I didn't earn that title until after I had sold the dealership in 2006. And okay. I, I think it really stems from the fact that I, I entered uh, uh, a stage in my career where I was teaching writer skills, backcountry writer skills, which we still do today. And mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where that uh, name came from. Okay. That definitely makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. So with, with rider skills, you were mainly doing backcountry stuff when you got into Rimshaw, not specifically hill climb. Were, were there, did you see a difference in the riding style between what you were using in the, in the backcountry versus what the hill climbers were using? And was there an advantage to that back then? Or did they maybe have the advantage in that discipline? Just curious how they correlate with each other. Uh, you know, time. that's an interesting question. Uh, I, uh, I feel like in some ways I had an advantage uh, because in the backcountry, you have to learn to read the terrain and look for traction and uh, learn uh, how to manage the sled so that you can get it a few feet higher on the hill, for example. And every, every, every bump that you approach has to be done in such a manner that it doesn't slow you down or scrub off speed. And it's important that the, the track uh, hooks up. And so the suspension has to work uh, in such a manner that it'll keep the skis low to the snow and 
uh, the track engaged in the terrain so you can keep propelling yourself up the hill. And mm -hmm. I think that a lot of racers did not understand that concept. They were good at going fast, right? They were mm -hmm. certainly good riders. And as long as the sled would keep going, they could ride it up the hill. Uh, but I, I think if, if I had an advantage, it was in reading the terrain and using everything to my advantage, uh, even though maybe, maybe I was, or was not as good of a rider, but, uh, I, I certainly knew how to make the sled go a few feet higher on the hill. Yeah. Very cool. And that, that led to some victories and how many times have you won the did you win the Jackson Hole hill climbs? I think I've got six uh, world championship titles there. Yeah. Wow, that that's very impressive. And when what year was the the first one? Uh, you know, I don't even know. Uh, I can tell you that um, uh, with uh, with Rimshaw, there's a circuit that um, uh, you follow during the course of the year and there, mm -hmm. there could be up to 10 races. Most of the time there was, you know, six or eight that we attended and, and Jackson was the, the, the event that everyone looked forward to. It was, uh, it was the big daddy and it's the one that you wanted yeah. to do the best at. And I felt really comfortable at all of the, uh, hill climbs on the circuit. Uh, traveling, uh, doing, you know, in competition. And, uh, but at Jackson, there was this intimidation factor. The hill was bigger. Uh, it was a ski hill where most of the other hills were not. They were just backcountry hills. Uh, there were a lot of people watching. Uh, there, there was just generally a lot of fanfare. And I can tell you that the, the hill intimidated me. And when we first started racing, a stock sled never did climb that hill and go over the top. And so we were building mod sleds that were capable of that. Yeah. But they struggled as well. And, and as a, as a racer, so did I, uh, just, uh, with, with competition, hill climb, you don't get a practice run there's no uh let me try it again or there's no warm-up runs there's there's nothing uh you have to tune and prep your sled off site and so when you when you arrive it's all race and uh there's just a lot of factors that that create a uh an intimidation factor and yeah. uh, and i certainly um, felt that as much or more as any other writer. I, I don't think I ever made it to, the, uh, uh, let me rephrase. I didn't make it to the top of that hill in probably the first six uh, years of my career. And then after that, <laughs> then I started uh, figuring it out. So, Okay. Very cool. And, and during those six years, you were probably for fun still riding in the back country and, and pushing the sleds there, right? Yeah, and tuning, and of course, and and but it's the uh, it's the other events, the other competitions that uh, uh, prepare you for Jackson. Uh, yeah, because uh, uh, because the other the other competitions are they're a race. You're racing against the other racers, and in the backcountry, it's less of a race, right? It's still competitive, yep. but it's less of a race. Yeah, definitely, and. In that, something that kind of revolutionized, revolutionized backcountry snowmobiling is the concept of wrong foot forward. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I saw that for the first time on, on the school DVDs and then, you know, getting into guiding and instructing, showing that concept to people. When did, when did wrong foot forward first initially come into the, the snowmobiling world? Uh, yeah, I don't know the date. Uh, I can tell you the first time that I heard the phrase, it came from Steve Jaynes. Steve is, uh, or at least at the time was an editor of Snow West magazine. A lot of people okay. recognize his name. 
uh, we were in the back country together uh, on a ride. Um, uh, whenever you go with a magazine editor, you're doing snowmobile evaluations or you're showing him something or he's whatever the case is. I don't even remember what it was then. I was riding Arctic Cat and uh, I kind of got him in a jam in, in the trees on a side of a hill. And, you and don't say. <laughs> yeah, imagine that. <laughs> and uh, uh, came back to gather him up and he had all these excuses about, you know, uh, uh, dangling off the side and wrong foot forward, meaning that you're running with with the wrong foot forward on the running board and all and and he just randomly come up with that phrase and and it was something that kind of stuck with me i i i le- i liked that phrase and and it kind of adopted it and when that whenever that was it had to been in the early 2000s uh something like that so even though uh, I was using that same ride technique uh, during competition and backcountry riding early, early on, we never really referred to it as anything specific. It, it was mm-hmm. just a riding stance that, that naturally developed. And yeah. uh, there, were, there were quite a few people that used that strategy writing strategy that form if you will Mm -hmm. yep uh but i feel like i'm i'm the one that kind of developed it and started promoting it and and teaching people how to use that correctly yeah definitely and so you kind of started doing that and that you what you just said there is started teaching it to people Mm-hmm. And fast forward to today, you've got Ride Rasmussen style, a, a riding instruction school. When did when did you start to realize that, you know, you have some serious talent on a snowmobile and I want to share this with other people? When did that become kind of an organized thing rather than we're going to go ride with Brett today and he'll show you something <laughs> fun? Well, it's kind of interesting how that all evolved. I, I never... Uh, I never had the attitude that I had serious talent. Uh, I, I sold the dealership in 2006. And at the time, uh, Chris Brandt was doing demo rides for Arctic Cat, uh, promoting the M-Series sleds. And part of that program, and I'd been riding with him and, and helping him with this uh, uh, on occasion when I had uh, an opportunity. And uh, the demo ride was less about showing the sled off and more about teaching people how to ride it so mm-hmm. that they would want to own one. And yeah. you have, you have to understand that the M series uh, beginning in 2000 model year, 2005 uh, Arctic cats M seven was a brand new concept in uh mountain sled uh, design. It was the first ever, uh, mountain specific sled all previous mountain sleds to this point in time were derived from trail sleds Mm -hmm. and this was a mountain specific sled it was a stand-up sled and you couldn't ride it sitting down uh and it it just required um a few tricks it wasn't hard to ride but it was more tippy than than the standard sleds at a higher center of gravity which was designed into it and so our our goal was to teach people how to ride it so they would like it because Arctic Cat didn't feel like people would would buy it just by riding it. They needed some tips. And so when I sold the dealership, uh, Arctic Cat called and asked me if I'd take over the demo program from Chris and which I didn't have anything else to do, right? And uh, yeah. they were willing to pay me to ride a snowmobile. So why not? And Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd do the same. Yeah, and so I don't know how many years that lasted, three or four years. And Arctic Cat was paying me to drive around and take uh, consumers out on the mountain. And... I was teaching, but I didn't really have 
a solid curriculum. Uh, I honestly probably didn't even know what I was teaching for the most part. It was during during this period of time when we started doing the school DVDs. Yeah. And I think we did six of those. So we we had them for six years, one a, yeah. one a year. And uh, they were really pretty successful in helping people understand the technique that we talked about. Uh, yeah. Eventually, Arctic Cat pulled the plug on the demo program and moved uh, to something else in their marketing program, whatever. And uh, so that forced me to, I was at a crossroads, you know, what am I going to do now? And, but I had a lot of, I had created a, a quite a following with the school DVDs and just generally driving around and meeting a lot of people. And, and so I, I started getting requests to travel and, and help people learn how to ride back country. And I had no business plan. I had no business model. I had nothing. I was just flying by the seat of the pants. And yeah, uh, I was. I found myself in Norway and Sweden and uh, Iceland and uh, uh, these people who I all because of the internet and yeah. uh, the school DVDs. They were finding me and. I was going to Canada and all over the Western U.S. And uh, it, it ultimately developed into what we have today is Ride Rasmussen style. So it's pr pretty crazy. Yeah, definitely. Well, that's so funny. You're just flying by the seat of the pants. I relate that, you know, a lot into my life. I had when I moved to West Yellowstone, I had no clue what I was doing. I, just, I bought a sled and I paid a little bit too much for it to have an extra room for about a week. And uh, yeah, I, I was borrowing money from my dad <laughs> to be able to stay there and just ride. And one thing led to another and people were like, yeah, T-Mac, you can stay and ride for a little bit longer. Just keep helping out. So that's cool to hear that you were doing kind of the same thing with the instructing on all of that. And so if, if schooled was kind of the the precursor to a lot of the success that is has come in now, you know, Ride Rasmussen style and a, a curriculum. Who was kind of the the masterminds of the school DVDs? You were working with Chris. You were going all over the place. And what year and how how are they? We should put this on film and get it out to more people. Well, well there's a story behind that, and okay. uh, I was on a demo ride in Telluride, Colorado. Uh, um, I did most of the solo. I didn't really have anybody uh, that would travel with me from time to time. I'd have somebody would tag along. But uh, most of the time I was solo and I'd go from one town to the next. And and in this on this particular ride, uh, there was an individual who I did not know uh, by the name of George Marsh, who uh, was one of the guests. And uh, he had this M7 turbocharged 175-inch uh, track that he felt like was the answer to uh, anybody's snowmobile. And what I didn't know at the time was he he came to show me how to ride a snowmobile. I'm the I'm the old guy, and uh, <laughs> you know he he wanted he wanted me to see what he had built and, and that he could ride it. And yeah. I, I can, I can, I had enough experience by now that I could kind of pick these individuals out in the parking lot. And, oh yeah. And we'll, well, we'll, we'll see how this day goes. And <clears throat> part of my program, uh, we change and Chris, Chris and I together, uh, kind of changed the way people approach the backcountry uh, mm -hmm. with this ride technique. But what we what we found is most riders would leave the trailhead. They would go to their designated rendezvous area in the backcountry, be it a meadow or a lake or whatever it was. And uh, uh, have a sandwich or lunch and play in the meadow and, and make tracks in the powder. And then they'd go home. And 
And what we lacked here was the challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. Early on, the challenge was getting there, right? But the snowmobiles yeah. have gotten good enough now that there was no challenge to get to the rendezvous spot. And and I kind of felt like that the adventure was lost. And so what we did when we did these demo rides is we, we even though the route was planned by whoever our host was, they would they would intentionally go to the rendezvous place. It was just standard practice. And but Chris and I would not allow that. We would start uh, as soon as, as soon as we left the trailhead. We're looking for places to leave the trail. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because we're looking for a challenge and, and our yeah. purpose is to show people how to ride these snowmobiles. And so this is exactly what happened. Uh, I found a place to leave the trail. George followed me. He was, he was right on my tail uh, from the very beginning. Uh, and I, I left the low side of the trail headed towards a ravine and I got halfway down. It was one of these slopes that rolls off and you can't see the bottom until you get until it's too late, right? I got I got over the edge far enough to where I decided that it wasn't going to be a good outcome yeah. to to continue. So I did a U turn and went back up to the trail. Uh, this is, you know, it's what we did on these sleds. Yeah, and George couldn't do that, <laughs> and he was <laughs> he was off his sled. Uh, trying to pick the back end and it was it was a late season ride so it wasn't like it was deep powder or anything like that and he yeah. was switching the back end of his sled around so that he could go uphill and yep. this is a 175 inch track and he you know i kind of watched him uh i didn't offer too much help yet uh yeah. thought i'd let him suffer for a minute and oh yeah anyway he he made it out of there and we went on up the trail he ultimately we found a a place where it was pretty technical and and i was showing the people how to ride the sled and what it could do and uh at the end of the day we came down and uh george i was in the trailer uh changing out of my riding gear or whatever and george comes in the trailer and he, he goes dude you got to show me how to do that. <laughs> and so yeah. it was, it was an instant friendship. Uh, yeah. And, and he was a, uh, I don't know if, if he was, if I could call him a videographer in the beginning, but he, he was a still photographer uh, okay. who wanted to be a videographer. Yeah. And it was his idea. It was his concept he wanted to make videos to show people how we rode these snowmobiles because he thought that was the most cool thing in the world uh, to yeah. be able to do what we were doing. And, yeah. and so, so that's where it started. That's right there that day. And George actually would uh, meet up with me whenever I was within a few hundred miles of where he lived in Southern Colorado. Yeah. And, because he wanted to learn more about it and uh and he became a pretty good writer uh eventually and in the course of doing the videos for that six-year stint that we did them uh he would travel to idaho and montana and wherever he could hook up with me or chris or both of us together and and make videos and and we because of george we were pretty successful at that yeah that's awesome. I love that story. He, he came to teach you how to ride snowmobiles. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny. Favorite, favorite part. Man, I, I relate to that a lot when I, well, on two aspects. When I came out for the first time it, to ride in the backcountry down in West when, when I, was, I had just turned 13 years old and it was like my second or third trip out there. And I'd been practicing this wrong foot forward thing that I learned from the school videos in, in the ditch. And I would just go back and forth and, and practice on the cornfield, seeing how long I could ride on one ski and in position one to get, you know, find the balance points and how the throttle reacts in the brake. And I, I remember exactly where I was in cabin Creek and it was a similar situation of it. There is no out You're I'm pointing downhill 
have to flip it around. And my dad's friend, Lucas Deutsch, we call him Sven. He, he got there and he kind of laughed at me like, what are you going to do now? And I was like, I've been watching these school things. And I did a, a downhill U-turn and, and came right up. And he was very, yeah, impressed. And then fast forward into the the guiding. Um, I've got a little bit of facial hair, but it ain't much. And people would come in and, you know, see the baby face kid, Taylor. And ugh, this guy, he's not going to be able to get us anywhere. And then we would go into the back country and, and they'd realize, okay, we can maybe have a good time with this kid. Mm -hmm. So that that's really cool to hear that original story. I've not heard that anywhere. Um, and so there, there's kind of two other things that I wanted to dive into within that. So that was kind of the late 2000s, like between 05 and uh, 2010. And you said in 2005, the M7 is what kind of revolutionized backcountry snowmobiling as we know it. What part did you and or others play into developing that was that like years in the making and to what involvement did you have in the development of the m series uh so uh i had a i was heavily involved in the m series development um i think that it's fair to say that this was the most tested sled that arctic cat ever released uh there was a lot of uh, politics going on at Arctic Cat about, uh, you know, the mountain sled program and, uh, you know, how much they should money they should put into it and one thing and another. And there was a young uh, uh, engineer uh, that went to work for Arctic Cat right out of engineering school by the name of Jason Howell. I didn't know mm -hmm. him at the time. Uh, uh, but he was originally from West Yellowstone, Montana, and he's yep. working now in Thief River Falls, Minnesota, and he's in charge of the mountain sled development. And he called me, I don't remember what year it was, maybe model year, uh, I want to say 99, well, it's probably model year 2000. And at the time, the mountain, the Arctic Cat mountain sleds had really taken a dive. Uh, they were not uh, working the way they needed to work. And I was in the dealership and I was, I, I didn't have another brand. I only had Arctic Cat to sell. So I, I was dedicated to making these sleds work. And we did clutch kits. We tapered the tunnels. We rolled the chain cases. We, uh, put different tracks on them. We did, we did everything, uh, that we, uh, knew, knew how to do that we could figure out to do, I should say, to make these sleds perform in the deep snow. And, uh, somehow Jason, uh, learned about our program and he invited me to bring a couple of my sleds to Island Park where the Arctic engineering team was working and use, use these for a comparison, uh, just to show them, you know, what's going on. And, uh, and I did, I was, uh, this was my first ever, a trip to Island park to, to work specifically with, uh, an engineering team. And I was, uh, I got to tell you, I was pretty excited about it. Oh, yeah. And, uh, in the course of this, uh, couple of days, I was able to show them with a few modifications that you could really make a, a good mountain sled. Uh, but what they had to compare with was, um, wasn't competitive. It wasn't even close. Yeah, and, definitely. and, uh, what this led to was a long relationship with Jason and, uh, the concept of a mountain specific sled, which, became uh, the M series. And we did, uh, we, we didn't start immediately. We had to actually uh, develop a, a sled, an interim sled, if you will, that uh, uh, Arctic Cat could sell, uh, which became the 1M. So okay. my sled, the modifications that I did to my sled became the new 1M. And uh, it, it, it was actually a pretty pretty good sled. Uh, we we spent 
some trips. Some we did some test trips to British Columbia uh, in, in developing this sled. The King Cat was a derivative of of this project, and then that led to the development of the M series. And I rode that sled probably for three years uh, before it was released and presented to the public. So. Really? Uh, that was a great project. I I have no education beyond high school and working <laughs> with the engineering team was uh, quite an eye opening experience for me, made a lot of good lasting friendships and yeah, uh, uh, had fun with it. Yeah, that's really cool to hear. And the, yeah, just the humble beginnings, this farmer from Idaho is going to help teach all these engineers how to how they need to build their sled. Kind of interesting, yeah. That's very cool. And so in that, I guess, I would I would argue today, I'm curious if you agree that for the most part, a modern snowmobile is can access any terrain, so long as the rider has an idea of what of what they're doing. What when do you think it was that you realized that okay, these sleds can go anywhere and we need to be serious about some avalanche safety education within backcountry riding? Well, it kind of started with the M series uh, because we found that we could get into some pretty dangerous situations. And at that point in time, I knew about avalanches. I was aware of avalanche activity. I had friends that had lost their lives in avalanches, uh, but I didn't really understand much about avalanche safety, if you will. Um, and as the sleds got better, um, now from all the manufacturers, we're making better mountain sleds. And there were more and more snowmobilers being killed in the backcountry um, by because of avalanches. And mm -hmm. uh, I felt like that I was pretty avalanche savvy because of my experience in the backcountry and I triggered a few avalanches. Uh, I'd been uh, at this, you know, I'd been uh, buried in, in one avalanche mm -hmm. uh, and survived it. Uh, my point is, uh, because of my time in the backcountry uh, and the things I saw and took note of, I was kind of to some degree self-taught, but um, you don't know what you don't know until you start yep. learning, right? And that was the yep. situation that I was in. And uh, I started to take avalanche education a little bit more serious along about 2015 or so. Uh, and we got involved with a company called Airy and help them yep. to develop uh, motorized specific curriculum. At this point, uh, they were teaching skier based uh, avalanche classes, but there was, mm -hmm. there was, there were a few people in the industry that were actually teaching motorized specific classes. And there's, there's really a difference uh, because on a, on a, motorized vehicle you can cover so much more terrain so so quickly um you have to be aware of your surroundings and and know know where you're going and yeah uh i think it was maybe 16 or 17 when uh we had a curriculum developed to the point we could start teaching it and it evolved actually from there. And, and today we have a really solid motorized curriculum and there's a, quite a few instructors that are uh, available to teach this. Uh, and I, really? you know, I, a uh, strong believer in it. Um, if you're, if you own a snowmobile and plan on going off trail mm -hmm. to any degree, you need to have some uh, avalanche education training. At, at, if you, if you want to stay alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more there as a, yeah, live, I lived in West Yellowstone for four years and was riding and guiding pretty much every day. And I would talk with people, you know, out in 
cabin or teepee creek or a, in line so i'd be like ah, we're not getting too far off the trail we're we're good we've been here a hundred times and yeah then you think back just in the last couple of years people who are really good you know rob kincaid unfortunately i remember when josh roth passed away and yeah mother nature doesn't care about who you are or how often you've been there it'll it'll take you yeah. quick it's what? been said it's been said that the only avalanche professionals are the dead ones and <laughs> and there's some truth to that, uh, yeah. uh, because there's a lot of, uh, uh, really smart avalanche people that have lost their lives, uh, in the back country. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's not something that we, we can take lightly. We we're teaching, uh, area avalanche classes, uh, weekly now in Island park. And, uh, okay. it's, uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of a fun class. We make it fun. It's it, we don't spend a lot of time in the classroom. It's field training, and uh, so you can come and and go out with us on your snowmobile, and and we'll we'll help you to look and understand more about avalanche safety. So, yeah, that's awesome, and that is a great class. I've taken it. I think once or twice back when I was um, living down there. And so, and you said you had mentioned briefly there that that you've been in an avalanche, and the only professional was was a is a dead one. So thank God you're not a professional. But <laughs> exactly. I do want to hear. I do. I, I I've heard this story before, but I'm, there's maybe a lot of people who haven't heard this story. What's the story of when you did get buried by an avalanche? Uh, I actually had a group out uh, uh, on a demo ride, um, and we were a, very aware of the high avalanche risk during this particular event and uh the group uh all knew about it and we agreed together that we would stay in low angle terrain and uh, uh be safe and we were actually doing a really good job of that uh we had been on the uh, on the way up to uh, this area we were riding. There was all sorts of road cut slides and you know small steep hills that that had slid or we actually uh, possibly triggered on the way up. I mean there was mm -hmm. avalanche activity going on all around us, uh, but we were in safe zones and it was it was all it was all okay. Uh, this is before I had any formal education. Uh, yeah. This is, uh, I don't remember the year, but it was probably around 2010, um, 11, some, somewhere along in there. Um, we, uh, during the course of the day, there were a couple of writers that came upon our group and uh, announced that they triggered an avalanche on the backside of the ridge that we were on and they were, it scared them and they were leaving. And I was really curious about looking at this, uh, slide. I, I'm trying to teach myself as much as I can. And, uh, so we, I took a couple of guys with me and we, we rode over and this was a big C-shaped bowl and we, I, I don't remember exactly how we entered the bowl or how we got into it, but we're sitting at the bottom in the center of the bowl on the avalanche debris, just looking at the destruction and the big pile of snow and, and taking it all in. Uh, mm -hmm. And at this point uh, we decided to return to the group and the, the easiest and best way, well, obviously not the best way, but the easiest way was to ascend the right side of the C-shaped bowl that had not yet slid. And uh, we, I personally, I felt like that if it was going to slide, it would have slid with the, with the rest yeah. of the bowl. Um, so I, I deemed it safe. Uh, there were, uh, four of us. So what, so a proper avalanche protocol is to, you know, only expose one rider at a time. And we followed that practice. The first guy ascended and waited at the ridge. 
Uh, yeah. I was to be the second guy, so I I started to make my way up, and about two thirds hill, uh, the hill broke loose right above me. So I was on the, I found myself on the, no, I was on the solid slab, and it was the upper third that uh, lifted and came towards me. Okay, and I, what I should have done is immediately immediately deployed my avalanche bag. Uh, but I felt like I wanted to try and get on top of the slide rather than getting run over by it. So I grabbed a handful yeah. of throttle and squared up to it. It was heavy, dense, rained on snow. Mm. Uh, and so when the slide collided with my sled, it upset my sled. I came off the sled uh, and immediately found myself under the snow. At this point, I could not uh, find my uh, trigger handle for my avalanche pack. I I could only get a handful of snow. I couldn't I couldn't yeah. I couldn't deploy that. Uh, I, it, this was a slow moving slide. I was under the snow, but uh, I could feel my body sliding down uh, following the imperfections in the terrain and eventually came to a stop. And mm -hmm. my legs were exposed. I, I knew that my legs were exposed, but I was okay. face down uphill uh, and I couldn't move. Uh, but I, I really wasn't worried so much because I knew that the other two guys were nearby and they had watched everything happen. And I knew that my legs yeah. were exposed. And okay. <clears throat> they come along. Uh, what I didn't know is my sled was on top of me too. And so they had to remove the oh. sled uh, and proceed to dig me out. And my my concept was, well, I'll feel them brush the snow off my back and I'll just stand up. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it seems reasonable. Uh, but that's not what happened. They were actually lifting me out of the snow uh, after they uncovered me before I realized what was going on. And that's because I was starting to fade. I'd been under the snow mm -hmm. for a few minutes. I don't yeah. know exactly how long, but long yeah. enough that uh, I was fading. I, did, I was lacking of oxygen, and yeah. so I was starting to fade. And uh, uh, fortunately, they were able to get me up, and I, I, uh, I didn't suffer any ill effects other than uh, I think my sled uh, broke a couple of ribs when uh, – <laughs> when I hit that leading edge of that slide. Yeah. And uh, other than that, you know, it's, uh, um, I, I recovered pretty quickly after a few weeks, um, but it mm -hmm. was, that that by itself was a pretty serious wake up call for me, I think, so. Yeah, I can't imagine. And how how was it with your wife when you, when you got home or you were like, all right, honey, I'm gonna go out and, and ride again? Did she get she, a little bit more hard on you? She was pretty concerned. And and, and it's like, uh, I did these demo rides solo for the most part. And I this was another solo trip. Uh, and I called her when I got headed home uh, that night. Uh, I, I had a, about an eight-hour drive, but I was headed home. And mm -hmm. uh, told her what had happened. And she was uh, pretty anxious about uh, the story. Uh, and after that, I, it took me, I don't know what I did to convince her to let me go out again, again but <laughs> she did. Uh, and uh, yeah, the rest is history. So, so now we're teaching people how to be safe. So, yeah, absolutely. That's so cool. And yeah, I want to respect your time. I've got two other quick things for you as we, as we wrap up here is, yeah, you've got so, so many experiences from, I mean, back in 1968 when you got your first snowmobiling or snowmobile. And I know I'm not the only one in the snowmobile community that would say you're one of the pioneers of backcountry riding as we know it. 
And so as that was coming to fruition and you're riding in Rimshaw and you're just starting to develop the M series in the late nineties, early two thousands, knowing what you know now, if you could travel back into time, what advice would you tell yourself? Um, you know, just knowing what you know now. Oh, wow. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, uh, I, I, I can say that what I don't think is fair is for all the, the new generation snowmobilers out there. Yeah. They're starting out on good equipment and I don't <laughs> think that's fair. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, but isn't, that's the, the fruit of my labors, right? We have, yeah. we have good equipment and we have, uh, a writer skills curriculum that we can teach people how to write and be safe with. And I never had any of that in the beginning. And, uh, but yet we had fun. And, uh, and I, I, I've, I've said this many times and I'll say it again. Uh, yep. The only reason we have snowmobiles is to recreate on, right? Uh, we yep. buy snowmobiles for fun. There's very few people in the world that uh, use snowmobiles for utilitarian purposes uh, you know, there's uh, in in certain parts of the world in Alaska, they use sleds to haul freight in uh, uh, using the river roads in Russia. They use sleds for various utilitarian purposes, but mostly we use it for recreation. And yep. it doesn't matter how good your sled is. It doesn't matter uh, how good of a rider you are. It doesn't matter what your skill set is. The only thing that matters is that we have fun when we're out there and there's no rules. There's no speed limits. There's no boundaries. You can go anywhere you want. Have fun with it. Just have mm -hmm. fun. That's awesome. I like that a lot before. Yeah. Now that I'm not riding and guiding every day, you know, people ask like, did you go to college? I'm like, no, I, I didn't. I actually went and I rode snowmobile professionally for the years that I could have, <laughs> you know, went to school. And I, I think I got more experiences, relationships, leadership skills, all of that. It was well worth it for me. And they're like, so like you were racing and like, did people come see you? It's like, not exactly. It is what you make it. And, yeah. and unless you've gotten out there into the back country, it's really hard to understand or comprehend the the places you go, the views you get to have and what these machines are actually, actually capable of. Yeah. So I like that you say that. And so speaking of, of me, you know, being out of the industry for the last few years, I've not <laughs> back when I, I was riding and guiding all the time, I would always be posting on my Instagram story and Facebook. Cause I had the best office ever. And I would, you know, get messages from all these people, jealous and and now i'm on the other side of that and so i try not to scroll through social media too much i got to stay focused here before i can uh you know go back out and, and ride all the time again so as far as electric snowmobiles are coming a long way in cars and yeah and within cars and i know there's a company i think it's called tyega how long is it do you think until we see electrical snowmobiles that are just as capable and comparable to today's mountain sleds or do you know too much and you can't necessarily say? I'm just curious what your overall thoughts are on that. Yeah, I can speak to that. I uh, I think that to some degree I'm excited about electric vehicles because they uh, electric power is really aggressive. I uh, once on occasion I like to enjoy a, a go kart race and yeah. um, I I'm a motorhead so I. I, I'll always choose a gas powered a go kart first, but I've driven the electric ones and they're like, wow, they accelerate seriously, serious acceleration on those electric carts. Um, and I think that uh, the uh, from the performance perspective, a, a mountain sled could become a uh, uh, let me say an electric mountain sled could be really competitive in the back country, especially at perhaps a hill climb competition and stuff like that. Uh, I think the limiting factor though, is uh, the battery. Uh, yep. You could, you could do trail sleds uh, because let's face it, on, uh, it doesn't take as much horsepower on the trail 
to make the sled go. So you can make a, mm-hmm. a, a battery last for a while. But when you're in a bottomless powder snow at 10,000 feet on the side of a mountain, you're, you're going to use a lot of energy. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's the challenge. Um, I don't know. Uh, battery technology is improving every day. And I truly believe that there will be a time when we uh, are riding electric powered mountain sleds, but I don't think it's next year. Cool. I don't, I don't either. And I was talking with somebody recently about that all. And I was like, man, I, I had mentioned the battery and they're like, yeah, but it's going to be really cool because they have electric dirt bikes. And they're like, they, they talked about how different of an experience it is being completely quiet on what you're riding. And so I know like when I'm snowboarding in the back country and, you know, just hearing the, the, the whoosh of, you know, going in the snowflakes and power turns, I can't wait to, yeah, do that on a much bigger scale on a, on an electric sled as soon as they're, yeah, available. <clears throat> T-Mac, you'll probably live long enough to have that experience. <laughs> I don't know Heck if I yeah. will. <laughs> well, well, if they do, we got to get out and ride when uh, when they are around. Yeah, I agree. Love to make make a day out of it. Yeah, but yeah, so that yeah, that's all you know. Kind of the all the ideas I wanted to ask you in in this conversation. Um, I just want to extend gratitude again to you. Thank you so much. The this hearing the story of the schooled videos, how that all started for you, and that's what taught me how to ride. And I remember when Schooled Four came out, I went to Heydays. And I was like, dad, I'm going to get Brett Rasmussen's autograph. He's on the cover. And I've gotten that and have had the opportunity to be become friends with you and have you on the uh, on my podcast. This is going to be the very first episode that comes out as an interview. First one's a quick monologue. The second one is going to be this. So thank you so much for helping all of this come full circle to me. I, I appreciate you. I'm excited for this. Uh, I appreciate uh, what you're doing uh, to take to help. Uh, take the industry forward too. This is uh, this is a great concept. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, you have a great day, Brett, and uh, hopefully see you out on the snow here at some point this winter. You bet. Take care.